So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. People are going to be coming in, but we want to start on time. We have so much uh, information and discussion to have tonight. Welcome. My name is Michelle Chalmers. I am representing the world of Wellesley, along with my fellow board members who are here, if they would raise their hands so everyone can see. Yay! There's Sajida in the front. So I have a lot of wonderful women um, helping this evening. So we have um, obviously registration and then the books uh, for sale in the back. And we'll also hopefully save some time for Chuck and Richard to sign books if you brought them, if you had already had them. Because you were part of the third annual World of Wellesley Community Read. This is a very exciting event that the World of Wellesley um, started about three years ago. We got the idea from the library, thought it was a great idea to be able to invite the community uh, and our neighbors uh, to read a common book together and then hold a book talk with your organization or your group or friends and then come to an author visit. So if anyone is familiar and has been on our track for three years, we started with Waking Up White by Debbie Irving. And then last year we had Chuck Collins, who is the author of Born on Third Base, a one percenter makes the case for tackling inequality, bringing wealth home, and committing to the common good. It's an amazing book and we had Chuck here last year in this very room for an author visit. And so now tonight we are very, very excited for our third uh, choice of books, uh, The Color of Law, The History of How the Government Segregated America by Richard Rothstein. So we're very excited that every, everyone is here this evening. Uh, we hope that you learn more about the world of Wellesley. If you're not familiar, we do have some booklets in the back, our website, worldofwellesley.org. Uh, we'd love to uh, keep you on our mailing list for other events that we do throughout the year. And so this evening, what we're going to do is I am going to introduce um, author Chuck Collins. He will be our moderator for the evening. And we're very thankful that he um, uh, accepted our invitation to do that this evening. How many people were here last year and heard Chuck speak? Excellent. All right, great. Thank you. So Chuck Collins is a senior scholar at the Institute of Policy Studies, where he directs the program on inequality and co-edits inequality.org. I definitely recommend for you to go to the site and sign up on their mailing list. He sends out a weekly uh, information, uh, blog, posts, facts, um, it's really a wealth of knowledge about the work that uh, he and his group is doing at inequality.org. Um, we talked about his newest book. If you haven't read um, Born on Third Base, please do. Um, he is also the co-author with Bill Gates Sr. of Wealth in Our Commonwealth, Why American Should Tax Accumulated Fortunes. And if you haven't read that book, definitely pick that one up too. So thank, thank you so, so much for your attention. attention. I am going to welcome Chuck Collins up to moderate um, the event this evening. He will introduce our wonderful speaker, Richard Rothstein, and then we will um, do a little bit of uh, pair sharing, and Chuck and Richard will have a conversation together, uh, and then we will open it up for comments and dialogue. So thank you so much, and Chuck, welcome. And thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle, and the team, the board, volunteer board of, of World of Wellesley, well, and, 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 the, and the extraordinary work you're doing to sort of help transform and, and, uh, and make Wellesley a welcoming community to all. And um, as Michelle said, uh, we're going to hear from Richard, uh, a substantial talk from him. Uh, we'll have a chance to reflect a little bit in pairs or small groups. Uh, Richard and I will have a brief chat, and then we'll move to kind of an open question format. 
Um, so we are very honored uh, this evening to have Richard Rothstein here, uh, author of this new book, The Color of Law, which is creating, you know, causing a real sensation. People are reading it, talking about it. He's here in the Boston area. Um, he was at Harvard, Harvard Law School today. He's with the Mass Community Bankers Association tomorrow. Came all the way from Berkeley, California to be here, and we timed his visit to land perfectly between nor'easters, uh, so he can, uh, but we're, we're um, you know, The Color of Law is a very important book, because it shows how the past, how the legacy of residential segregation shows up in the present, how the past is in the present, how this prior century of uh, de jure legal and public policy enforced government sanctioned patterns of residential segregation are imprinted on our geography, on our neighborhoods, on our, our city. Um, so I think Richard is really both helping us understand the history, the story of how we got to where we are, the particular problems that we're struggling with in this moment, and how much of that is still rooted in this history of residential segregation. Um, and I think that Richard also really, in Color of Law, brings to the fore a number of remedies that I think we can all begin to grapple with. So Richard is, the, is a research associate at the Economic Policy Institute, which is based in Washington, DC. He's also a fellow at the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, in addition to The Color of Law, he's written a number of other books about education policy and other issues related to race and education. Uh, one of the books I read that I highly recommend is called Class and Schools, Using Social, Economic, and Educational Improvement to Close the Black-White Achievement Gap. Um, so again, I mentioned uh, Richard is with us all the way from Berkeley. He could be there in Berkeley where the flowers are already blooming, in fact, are blooming pretty much all year round. The trees are green and lush, but he's chosen to come here and be with us. So let's give him a Wellesley welcome. Thank you very much, Chuck, and thanks to all of you for uh, coming here this evening to engage in this conversation with me. Uh, uh, Chuck says that I'm here between Nor'easters, so that means you have another one that's coming? <laughs> Tell us about it. Um, as, as you all know, um, this country in the 20th century, we made the decision uh, to abolish racial segregation. We uh, concluded that it was wrong, that it was immoral, that it was actually harmful to both African Americans and to whites, and that it was unconstitutional. It was a violation of our national principles. And beginning in the 1930s, uh, civil rights groups began a campaign to uh, desegregate first law schools. That was the first thing that uh, uh, lawyers in the civil rights movement attacked because they figured if judges were too stupid to understand anything else, they could figure out that you couldn't get a good legal education in a segregated law school. And then they went on, they built on that to desegregate uh, colleges and universities. And then from there, as you all know, they uh, succeeded in winning Brown versus Board of Education to desegregate elementary and secondary schools. And then the civil rights movement began to grow, and the, the result of that was a series of laws in the 1960s that abolished segregation and lunch counters and buses and water fountains and public accommodations of all kind. And yet, we've left untouched the biggest segregation of all, which is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. I've um, lived in many of them. Uh, every one I've lived in, had clearly defined areas where only whites or mostly whites lived and clearly defined areas where only African Americans or mostly African Americans lived. Without exception, every metropolitan area is residentially segregated and we all accept it as part of the natural environment. Uh, 
Um, unlike our commitment to abolish segregation in all of the other areas I talked about, not only have we not succeeded in abolishing residential segregation, we haven't even tried. We accept, as I say, as a part of the natural environment that we're going to live in a nation that's segregated by race. And I think the reason that we do that is not um, entirely hard to understand. Uh, it's a lot harder to desegregate neighborhoods than it is to desegregate the other things I talked about. If we pass a law desegregating water fountains, the next day people can drink from any water fountain. If we abolish segregation in buses, any, you can sit anywhere you want on a bus. But if we abolish segregation in neighborhoods, the next day things wouldn't look much different. And so in order to avoid taking on this more difficult task, we've adopted a national myth, a rationalization that excuses ourselves from addressing residential segregation as a violation of the Constitution, as an obligation, uh, a constitutional obligation and a moral obligation. We've adopted a national myth. And we've given the national myth a name, and uh, this myth is held by uh, people across the political spectrum, by liberals and conservatives, by whites and blacks. It's pretty universal, and that name is de facto segregation. What we say is, you've all heard this term, right? You know, we, we say we have de facto segregation in neighborhoods. It's not like the other segregations we abolished. The other segregations we abolished were created by government, they were created by law, and regulation, and public policy. Um, they were enforced by the state. The residential segregation that we see around us is not like that. It's de facto. It sort of happened by accident. We tell ourselves it happened because, oh, private people uh, wouldn't sell homes to uh, other race buyers. Or maybe African Americans and whites just happen to like to live with one another of the same race. They don't like to mix. Or maybe uh, private uh, real estate agents or banks uh, happened to uh, uh, discriminate and uh, enforced uh, racial boundaries. Or maybe it's just that black people don't have enough income to move into white neighborhoods, and that's why we've got it. All of these individual private decisions that government has nothing to do with uh, have created the racial boundaries we know. It's sort of accidental segregation. And if it happened by accident, it can only be unhappened by accident. It's not our responsibility to do anything about it. And um, I used to spend a lot of time, actually most of my time, writing about and analyzing education policy. And I came to understand that we could never solve the educational problems we have in this country so long as we had segregated schools, because when you take children with serious social and economic disadvantages uh, and concentrate them in single schools, uh, it becomes impossible to uh, overcome those disadvantages, to give children special attention if they come to school, uh, less prepared than uh, children from better educated homes or if they come to school uh, uh, drowsy from asthma. You know, African-American children have asthma at four times the rate, middle class children. If they come to school drowsy or sleepless or uh, maybe even absent from school. Uh, it's impossible for uh, teachers and schools to overcome these kinds of uh, uh, social and economic uh, challenges uh, when they're concentrated when entire schools have, have, where every children, child either has asthma or comes from a home where um, parents are poorly educated or lead poisoning or stress from parental unemployment or homelessness. You take children like that and you concentrate them in single schools, overcoming those problems becomes impossible. And so I was thinking about that. And, um, uh, we call schools where those uh, uh, children are concentrated, we call them segregated schools. And so I began to wonder why schools are so segregated. And then I read a Supreme Court decision in 2007. Uh, it was an education decision, it was a decision about uh, school desegregation. And in 2007, the Supreme Court uh, examined a, a, a desegregation plan in two school districts. One was Louisville, Kentucky. The other was Seattle, Washington. Uh, both of those districts understood uh, that they could never make the progress they wanted to make if their schools were segregated. So they adopted a choice program where parents and their adolescent children could choose which high school they would go to. But if their choice uh, happened to exacerbate uh, racial segregation, that choice wouldn't be honored in favor of a child's choice that would <clears throat> not exacerbate, that would help to desegregate. So if you had a high school with um, 
that was mostly white or all white, and one place was left, and both a black and a white child both applied to it, uh, the black child would be given some preference to help to desegregate the school. And the Supreme Court said that that was a constitutional violation. You couldn't do it. It prohibited the school districts of Louisville and Seattle from this very token plan. Uh, it couldn't be a more trivial plan. Most kids don't want to go to high school outside their own neighborhoods and away from their friends. And the cases where you have one place left in a high school and both a black and a white child applied, I mean, it's trivial. But the Supreme Court said it was a violation of the Constitution to do this because it said the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. Well, that's right. I thought that Chief Justice John Roberts was wise in making that observation. Um, it's uh, something that uh, I knew myself. And uh, in fact, schools are more segregated today than at any time in the last 45 years. And they're more segregated today because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. But then he went on to say that the neighborhoods in which uh, the schools are located are segregated because of all these accidental decisions. Government had nothing to do with it. It's de facto segregation. And under his constitutional theory, you cannot take the chi a child's race in account in trying to remedy something that the government had nothing to do with creating. And I remembered, after reading this case, about a, a situation I had read about some time before in Louisville, Kentucky. And some of you may know this story. In Louisville, Kentucky, in the 1950s, a white middle-class homeowner in the suburb called Shively had an African-American friend, an African-American Navy veteran, a middle-class guy with a good income, had a family, wanted to move to a, a better housing uh, than he had in uh, urban Louisville. But nobody would sell him a home. So uh, the white homeowner bought another house in his suburb, resold it to the African-American Navy veteran. And when the Navy veteran and his family moved into the home, a mob surrounded the house, protected by the police. Um, they threw rocks through the windows. They firebombed and dynamited the home. And when the riot was over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed the white homeowner, the white seller, for sedition. And I said to myself, this doesn't sound much to me like de facto segregation. And I had known a little bit more about it than that, so I decided, began this investigation, as I say, after reading this case in 2007, to see whether this was some kind of isolated incident of government enforcement of segregation, or whether there was a more consistent pattern. And what I concluded uh, as a result of the research that I've reflected in the book, The Color of Law, is that not only was it not an isolated incident, but that the reason we have racial segregation in every metropolitan area of this country is because of a very racially explicit, unhidden, written public policy enforced by the federal and state and local governments that was explicitly designed to create segregation in every metropolitan area of the country to ensure that African Americans and whites could not live with one another, near one another. And the policies that the government followed were so interrelated, so mutually, mutually reinforcing, and so powerful that they determine the racial boundaries that we have in this country today. And that if we understood this history, we would understand that the racial segregation that we have everywhere in this country is as unconstitutional as segregating water fountains or buses or lunch counters or any of the other um, less important areas, uh, not that any are unimportant, but less important areas that we desegregated in the mid 20th century. Uh, it's as unconstitutional uh, as these other areas. And because it's unconstitutional, we have an obligation, which we have avoided because we've denied the reality of state-sponsored segregation. We have an obligation under our Constitution to remedy it. So let me describe some of the most major policies, the most important policies the government followed to create segregation. I can't describe them all. And you'll have to read the book if you want to know many of them. But uh, I'll describe some of the more important ones. Uh, let me begin. Uh, by talking about public housing. Now, uh, I think all of you think you know, as I thought I knew. I'm not uh, telling you anything that I knew before I did this research either. I think you know or think you know what public housing is. It's a place where poor people live. It's a place where lots of single mothers with children, lots of young men 
without access to jobs in the formal economy, uh, engaging in oppositional behavior because of their aimlessness, uh, getting into confrontations with the police, sometimes violent. Uh, that's our image of public housing. It's what we, what we all think public housing is. But in fact, public housing in this country began not for poor people and not for minorities. It began as a program mostly for whites, working class families, uh, stable working class families with incomes that could afford rent, but in the Depression there was no housing available. And the government built public housing for families, not for poor people. They weren't admitted. Uh, in fact, in the Boston area, the, the, the first Boston Housing Authority had um, uh, social workers who visited the homes of public housing applicants to make sure that their furniture was of high quality and wouldn't lower the standards of public housing. They had to report on whether the children were well behaved. They had to inspect marriage licenses to make sure that there was no hanky-panky going on in public housing. This was middle-class public housing, working-class public housing, created by the federal government during the Depression when working-class families who did have jobs, and not everybody had jobs, but those who did have jobs could afford housing, but there was none available. And everywhere in the country, uh, the federal government, beginning with the Public Works Administration, one of the first New Deal agencies, segregated public housing, building separate projects for whites only and a few projects for African Americans, frequently creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. So in, um, in this area, in uh, Boston, the federal government built housing projects in Mission Hill. It built the Mission Hill projects for whites only, it built the Mission Hill East for African Americans only. And this is not because you know, whites happen to like to live with one another, so they all happen to apply to Mission Hill, and blacks happen to like to live with one another, so they all happen to apply to Mission Hill East. These were explicitly designated projects by race here in Boston, Massachusetts. A newspaper reporter once visited the projects and described the uh, office across the street from the projects where people went to pay their rent. He said there were two lines, two windows, one for Mission Hill, one for Mission Hill at least. One line was all white, the other hill was all black. He said, you could have been in Alabama, but in fact, you were in Massachusetts. Uh, in Cambridge, uh, Cambridge was an integrated community uh, in the um, early, mid-20th century. The Central Square area was about half black and half white. Uh, the Public Works Administration demolished housing in that area integrated housing and built two separate projects. The Newton Courts uh, project was for whites only. The Washington Elms project was for blacks only, explicitly designated, creating a pattern of segregation in Cambridge, which along with the Mission Hill project and others, created segregation in this community that otherwise might never have existed. And remember, we're not talking about poor people. We're talking about working class families. Um, the great African-American novelist and poet and uh, playwright Langston Hughes, uh, I don't know if any of you have read his autobiography, but uh, it's called The Big C. And he describes in his autobiography how he grew up in a neighborhood like Central Square, uh, a, an integrated neighborhood in downtown Cleveland. So he said there were many such neighborhoods in the country at that time. We would actually be stunned if we were transported back to the uh, uh, middle and early 20th century to see the extent of urban integration that there was. It's not something that uh, we're in any way familiar with today. Uh, urban neighborhoods were integrated simply because workers uh, didn't have uh, uh, automobiles to get to work. And they um, uh, had to walk to work. And since most employment was concentrated in downtown areas, they had to be either live close enough to work or else be able to, to walk or else be able to take short streetcar rides. Uh, to get there. So if you had uh, an industrial area, uh, warehouses and factories that had uh, African Americans and Irish immigrants and Italian immigrants and Jewish immigrants and rural migrants all living in the same, working in the same industrial area, they had to live nearby. The other reason we had uh, integrated uh, neighborhoods and urban areas everywhere in the country, even in the South, Jim Crow segregated lunch counters and water fountains and buses, but it didn't segregate housing. Because even in the South, workers had to live close enough to their workplaces to walk to work, and so there were integrated neighborhoods there. Um, uh, Langston Hughes describes how he grew up in an integrated Cleveland neighborhood. He said that his best friend was Polish in high school. He dated a Jewish girl. 
this was not uh, unusual. Uh, in, it wasn't uh, typical, but it wasn't unusual in the early to mid 20th century. But the Public Works, Works Administration demolished housing in that neighborhood and created separate housing, pro housing projects for blacks and for whites, creating a pattern of segregation that otherwise hadn't existed. And it helped to determine the future residential patterns in Cleveland. Uh, I'll give you one other example in Atlanta, just to illustrate that this also happened in the South, but uh, it wasn't simply a Southern uh, problem or, or sudden, uh, sudden activity. Uh, there's an area near downtown Atlanta called the Flats, which was integrated, like the Central Square and the uh, Central neighborhood in Cleveland. It was about half black, half white, not exactly, but uh, roughly 60, 40. Uh, the F Public Works Administration demolished housing in that neighborhood and built a housing project, a public housing project for whites only, forcing the African Americans uh, to double up with relatives, to subdivide uh, homes, uh, to find uh, housing where they could uh, in the Atlanta area. This went on all over the country. Um, during World War II, it became even more extreme because during World War II, uh, hundreds of thousands of workers uh, flocked to centers of defense production in the war industries to get jobs. Uh, there had been uh, high unemployment, as you know, in the Depression. It was World War II in the war industries that uh, uh, brought the country back to full employment. And hundreds of thousands of workers who uh, didn't have jobs or didn't have good jobs flocked the centers of, of the war, war production. Um, but they off, the, 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 the factories were located in places that couldn't absorb the, the influx of population. The government had to provide housing for these war workers. Uh, I describe in, in my book uh, a community, I, mean, I like to talk about places like Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Berkeley, California, because uh, uh, people think of those as liberal areas. And um, uh, I want to explain that if it happened there, you can probably imagine it happened everywhere. So I write about a community just north of Berkeley, a suburb of Berkeley called Richmond, California, which uh, was on the, the San Francisco Bay, and so it had a deep water port, and uh, it was the center of shipbuilding on the West Coast during World War II. Uh, the Kaiser shipyards were constructed there. There were no shipyards there before the war. By the end of the war, Kaiser had employed 100,000 people. If you count their, their spouses and families, uh, uh, you're talking about an influx of maybe 400,000 population to the town of Richmond, which had, which had a population before the war of about 20,000. How does a community of 20,000 uh, absorb 400,000 in the space of four years? It couldn't. If the government wanted those ships to continue rolling off into the bay, uh, it had to find housing for these workers. Richmond itself, I said, 20,000 people. It was an all-white community. There were very few African Americans on the West Coast before World War II. Uh, unlike uh, here in the East, there was no great migration of African Americans uh, during World War I. So this was a white community. It wasn't segregated, obviously, because there weren't any African Americans to segregate. There were a few living um, on the outskirts of town, working as domestics in white families' homes. Uh, these were typically wives of Pullman car porters who were um, hired by the railroads. The, the terminus of the Intercontinental Railroad was Oakland. The, the railroads would only hire African Americans as Pullman car porters, so the community around the terminal was integrated uh, because there were Pullman car porter families living in this broadly white population, and then some of them um, were living in the outskirts of Richmond working as domestics in, in white, white homes. The federal government built housing for the African-American workers uh, along the railroad tracks in the industrial area near the shipyards. It was temporary housing because the city of Richmond um, announced that any African-Americans who came to Richmond to work in the shipyards during the war would have to leave at the end of the war. They wouldn't, couldn't stay in Richmond uh, after the war. And it built housing for the white migrant workers, stable housing farther inland in the white industrial area. And this again happened everywhere in the country. Everywhere there was segregated housing built by the federal government, either reinforcing patterns of segregation or creating patterns of segregation as in Richmond that hadn't uh, existed before. And we have something that the social scientists call an existence proof that shows how um, unfounded this policy was, how unjustifiable it was, quite aside from its unconstitutionality. There was another shipyard in the, the San Francisco Bay Area uh, in Marin City, which is uh, 
You've heard of the Golden Gate Bridge. It's on the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge from uh, San Francisco. This shipyard grew so fast that uh, authorities had no time to segregate housing. They just built barracks for single men who were coming to work in the shipyard. And the men showed up. They handed out pillows and blankets and sent them off to the barracks. They didn't have time to create any segregation. Worked out fine. When the families arrived, uh, the city of, Rich, of, of Marin uh, built integrated housing for the war workers. It's the only place in the country I know of where they uh, built integrated housing for war workers, and it worked out fine. There was no problems, no reason. The Navy insisted that you had to segregate housing for war workers because it would interfere with uh, production efficiency if whites and blacks uh, lived with one another, even though they were working with one another in the war industries. Um, after World War II, there was also an enormous housing crisis because not only had no housing been built in the Depression, but um, during the war, during World War II, it was prohibited to use construction materials for civilian purposes. Uh, war, you could build housing for war, war workers, but not for others. And then after the war, uh, millions of returning war veterans came home needing housing, uh, forming families, uh, having the baby boom, um, doubling up with relatives. Uh, we had a national mothers-in-law crisis because of this uh, uh, heavy concentration, the doubling up and uh, living in Quonset huts and open fields. President Truman proposed a vast expansion of the national housing, public housing program after the war. And again, we're still talking about, keep in mind, we're still talking about working class families. These were returning war veterans. They had jobs in the post-war boom, but they uh, had no housing available that they could rent. And he proposed this vast expansion of the National Housing Program. And um, conservatives in Congress wanted to defeat it. They didn't want to defeat it for racial reasons. It was segregated. They have no objection to that. They didn't want to defeat it because they didn't like poor people. It wasn't for poor people. It was for working class families who were paying the full costs of the, of the public housing and their rents. They wanted to defeat it because they thought that public housing was socialistic. Uh, the private market should take care of it, and not that the private market was taking care of it. Uh, but they thought it was improper for the government to be housing uh, returning war veterans. And so they came up with a strategy that uh, uh, political scientists call a poison pill strategy. I don't know if that means anything to you, but a, a, a poison pill strategy is a, uh, an attempt by opponents of a bill in Congress to uh, get an amendment to the bill passed uh, that is pretty popular. But when it's attached to the bill, it makes the entire bill unpopular. Uh, how does it work? Well, the conservatives in Congress proposed an amendment to the 1949 Housing Act that from now on, all public housing had to be integrated. No more segregation in public housing. No more discrimination in public housing. It was a cynical proposal, <coughs> but they figured they would vote for it. Northern liberals would vote for it as well. And then when the full housing bill came before Congress as amended with an integration requirement, the conservatives would flip and vote against the integration, the, the entire bill. Uh, Southern Democrats would join with them in voting against the bill because they were all for public housing if it was segregated, but not if it was integrated. And so the bill would go down to defeat. And so Northern liberals campaigned against the integration amendment in 1949. They were led, uh, you know, I'm sure you know uh, uh, this name, they were led by Hubert Humphrey, the leading civil rights advocate in the United States Senate, who led the campaign against the integration amendment in 1949. Um, and they succeeded. Northern liberals voted against the integration amendment. Uh, they joined with Southern Democrats in voting against it. Then when the full bill came up to the floor of Congress, without the requirement of non-discrimination, uh, uh, the uh, both the Northern Liberals and the Southern Democrats voted for it, and the bill passed. And that's how we got many of the public housing projects uh, that we know today. The high rises that were built in places like Chicago and uh, St. Louis, uh, Pruitt Igo, uh, you're familiar with that, um, were built all over the country under the 1949 Housing Act. The federal government used this vote to defeat uh, integration, the requirement for integration in public housing as its excuse, as its justification for continuing to segregate all housing programs, not just public housing, for the next 15 years. 
And uh, you know, we're getting into pretty recent history. Well, for me, 1949 is pretty recent, but maybe, uh, maybe you can understand that the mid-1960s is pretty recent. And um, uh, the, the massive projects uh, that I mentioned were, were built in this way. Well, very soon uh, after uh, the, the projects were built in the early 1950s, the development occurred simultaneously almost everywhere in the country. It was quite surprising how similarly every, every uh, community was, but uh, throughout the country, all of a sudden, large numbers of vacancies uh, developed in the white projects and large numbers, long waiting lists in the black, for the black projects. It was surprising because uh, these were all working class families. Uh, they all had jobs in the post-war boom. The whites had better jobs than the blacks did, but they were all paying for housing. But somehow, large vacancies in the white projects and long waiting lists in the black projects eventually became so conspicuous and untenable to have projects near each other, uh, one of which had lots of vacancies and the other which had long waiting lists, that all the projects were opened up to African Americans. Soon they became almost all black. It's a similar, that's the situation we know today. And at about the same time, industry left the cities because industry no longer needed to be located near deep water ports or near railroad terminals because there were highways being built. And so they moved out to suburbs and to rural areas where they could get their raw materials and ship their finished products without being in downtown areas. So there were fewer and fewer jobs available to residents of public housing who were now almost all black. Uh, they became poorer and poorer as a result. Eventually, public housing had to be subsidized. It became a program for poor people. Uh, there was such a demand for it that uh, uh, middle class, working class families were actually kicked out of public housing uh, if their uh, income was sufficient to rent an apartment in the private market. And uh, public housing became the concentrated uh, poverty communities, slums really. The, the government ceased um, uh, maintaining them, ceased investing them once they were all black and once they were subsidized, and it became the kind of public housing that we know today. That's not how it began. But the question that I'm sure you're asking yourself, or I hope you're asking yourself, or maybe if you've read my book already, you are not asking yourself anymore. Um, but the question I asked myself when I read this history of public housing was why all these vacancies in the white projects? and Why long waiting lists in the black projects? And the reason for that was another federal program which was even more powerful and that was a program of another federal New Deal agency, the Federal Housing Administration, that uh, began a program to suburbanize the entire white population into single-family homes in the suburbs. This was a racially explicit program. Uh, it was designed, as I say, to suburbanize the white population exclusively into single-family homes in all white suburbs. Uh, before that, if a, a a family wanted to build a single, wanted to have a single family home in the suburbs, it would have to hire, a, buy some land and hire a builder to build a home. Maybe the, the real risk taker and taking builder might build three or four or five homes in the same place, but not on a mass scale. Uh, and only middle class families could afford to do something like that. There were very few working class families living in single family homes in the suburbs. The Federal <coughs> Housing Administration resolved to change that. And um, they recruited a cadre of mass production builders who would build giant suburbs uh, around every metropolitan area in the country. Uh, the most famous of these uh, you probably know of is uh, Levittown, east of New York City. But it was in every metropolitan area in the country. Uh, the symbol of suburbanization in the 1950s was Los Angeles. Uh, places, uh, suburbs of Los Angeles like Lakewood. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with these, these places, uh, Lakewood or uh, Panorama City or uh, uh, Westchester, west of Los Angeles. All of these were Federal Housing Administration projects for whites only. Uh, the way it worked was this. So someone like Levitt um, could never have assembled the capital to build 17,000 homes in one place on his own. That's how big Levittown was. Uh, some of these other suburbs uh, um, were equally large. Uh, maybe some of you um, remember hearing a song that Pete Seeger sang uh, um, Malvina Reynolds wrote it about the little boxes on a hillside made of ticky-tacky, and they all looked the same. Uh, this was a, a giant subdivision of about 15,000 homes built south of San Francisco, an FHA project for whites only. Levitt and, and uh, the builder of that project, uh, Henry Dolger, uh, 
uh, could never have assembled the capital to build uh, thousands and thousands of homes in one place. What they did was they went to the Federal Housing Administration and presented their plans for the development. Uh, they got the Federal Housing Administration approval for the architectural design of the homes, for the um, materials that were going to be used, for the layout of the streets, uh, for the setback, and they gave the Federal Housing Administration a required commitment that no homes would be sold to African Americans as a condition of getting the federal guarantee. The Federal Housing Administration even required Levitt and Dolger and the developers of these other suburbs to include a clause in the deed of every home in these subdivisions prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. This was a racially explicit written government policy. Nothing de facto about it. Uh, the, the Federal Housing Administration had a manual called the Underwriting Manual, which was distributed to appraisers around the country. Tens of thousands of them distributed because the appraisers were the people who had to approve at the local level the applications of developers to build suburban uh, communities. And the, the Underwriting Manual said that any uh, subdivision that was going to be approved had to be for the same racial class uh, not that any were built for African-American racial class, but it had to be for the same racial class. And they couldn't even be built um, uh, near an African-American community because it ran, quote, the danger of infiltration of incompatible racial elements. This is what the Federal Housing Administration uh, manual wrote. In my book, I have a picture of one, one developer in the, uh, Detroit wanted to build a small subdivision for white families only, just like the FHA required but the FHA thought it was too close to an African-American neighborhood. So before it would grant the loan, it required him to build a six foot high, half mile long wall, uh, separating a concrete wall, separating the, his development from the nearby African-American neighborhood. And there's a picture of that wall in my book, that FHA required wall. So the Federal Housing Administration, by this means, suburbanized the white population. The incentive to do this for white families, white working class families was so great, that they could move out of public housing where they were paying rent and move into a, an FHA or VA, Veterans Administration Finance um, subdivision, and pay less in their monthly housing costs than they were paying for rent in public housing. The consequences of this were, are enormous, and they affect uh, the landscape, uh, the racial landscape that we have in this country today. The homes that I'm describing, and this is everywhere in the country, um, uh, the suburbs I've mentioned and, and hundreds of hundreds of them in between were modest homes. They were for working class families. Uh, my, uh, my uncle was a returning war veteran. He bought a home in Levittown. Uh, he stocked vegetables in the supermarket. That was his job. These were not affluent families. These were working class white families. The homes were modest. They were Levittown, 750 square feet. Uh, the other uh, home, subdivisions I've talked about were similar, similar in size. They sold in the, about 1950 for $9,000 or so a piece. Uh, inflation adjusted in today's money, that's a little bit less than $100,000. So it's a $100,000 home. Any working class family, white or black, could afford to buy a home for $100,000 with an FHA or VA mortgage that required no down payment uh, and a 30-year mortgage or a 20-year mortgage. Um, only whites were permitted and encouraged to, to buy these homes. African Americans were prohibited from doing so and continued to live in rented apartments, either in, in uh, the private market or in some cases in public housing. Um, today, those homes in places like Levittown or Daly City, the, the, the Little Boxes Place or Lakewood, those homes sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. Uh, the white families who moved into those homes, the white working class families who moved th into those homes, uh, gained over the next uh, few generations, couple of generations. I mean, you, can, you can do the arithmetic, you can set, subtract $100,000 from the current market value of those homes. They gained in equity and wealth, in appreciation, $200,000, $300,000, dollars $500,000. Most Americans, except for the very wealthy, have gained what wealth they have from the equity they have in their homes. Um, they don't save much from uh, uh, their incomes. Uh, that's not where wealth comes from in this country. Uh, whites gained that kind of wealth. African Americans were prohibited from gaining it. The result is that uh, the white families used the wealth that they gained 
over the next couple of generations to send their children to college. They use it to weather emergencies. If, you're, if you've got wealth, you can weather uh, temporary bouts of unemployment. Um, you can't if, uh, if you don't have wealth. And they use it to bequeath it to their children, who then have down payments for their own homes or their grandchildren. Uh, and uh, perpetuated the, the wealth, uh, the transmission of wealth intergenerationally. The result is that today, African American incomes, on average, are about 60%, 60% of white incomes. There's also a, a big federal role in that disparity, and I have a chapter in the book describing it, I won't go into it now, but the, the, the income ratio is about 60%. African American wealth is about 10% of white wealth on average. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 10% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid-20th century. And that determines the racial landscape of this country today. It explains why African Americans can no longer afford uh, to buy homes in um, suburban communities. Uh, in fact, working class families of either race can't afford to buy homes at that price today, but those who have um, wealth inherited from their parents or grandparents uh, can sometimes do so. The wealth gap not only <clears throat> determines the, the continued residential segregation on its face, it also, of course, results in the kinds of incidents we had in Ferguson and Milwaukee and uh, uh, St. Paul and other places in the last few years where we've concentrated African Americans in, in urban communities without access to jobs or transportation or um, without access to schools that have uh, high achievement. Um, it also, the reason I got to this uh, 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 investigation was it also determines the achievement gap in schools where we segregate the most disadvantaged children in single schools. It freezes our, our um, social mobility in this country. What economists have demonstrated is that a low-income uh, family, a child from a low-income family who lives in a segregated uh, low-income community is much less likely to have a middle-class income as an adult as a child from an equally low-income family who lives in a less segregated community. So it, it impedes social mobility in this country. And that, yet, as I said, it's, it's unconstitutional. It's never been remedied. And we never tried to remedy it. Uh, because of my interest in education in the course of, of writing this book, of course, you can imagine, I, natural, I would look at textbooks. How, does this, how, would, how did high school and middle school textbooks teach this history? And um, I looked at um, you know, about a dozen of them, the most commonly used uh, high school textbooks in American schools today, middle school textbooks. Um, I conclude that every one of them, I don't know, a, good scientific word to describe it, every one of them lies about it. Um, they, uh, they, uh, the most commonly used American history textbook in this country, at least as of a couple of years ago when I looked at them, I assume it's still, if it's not the most commonly used, it, um, uh, it is one of the most commonly used still. It's called The Americans. It uh, is 1,200 pages long. It um, uh, has one paragraph in these 1,200 pages that is subheaded uh, discrimination in the North. It has one sentence about housing, and the sentence reads as follows. In the North, African Americans found themselves forced into segregated neighborhoods. That's it. Um, you know, I, as you heard in the introduction, you know, I, I not only wrote this book, I've written other books. I write lots of articles. I know how uh, editors work. They spend a lot of money hiring copy editors to look out for passive voice sentences. And, um, <laughs> this is one they missed. Um, you know, African Americans woke up one day, they looked out the window and they said, hey, we're in a segregated neighborhood. That's how it happened. And this is a crime. Because if the next generation doesn't learn this history any better than our generation has learned it, they're going to be in as poor a position to remedy it as we've been. So one of the things, I, I do a lot of speaking about this, this history. Um, it's uh, my mission to educate people about it. But one thing I always tell people is a very simple thing that everybody can do. Everybody has children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews or uh, siblings uh, who are in public schools. They have access to principals and teachers and superintendents and school board members. And we can look into how our schools are teaching this history or misteaching it. <coughs> 
and insist that it be taught accurately so that, uh, as I say, the next generation isn't uh, as confused as we've been uh, and misled as we've been, been about the myth of de facto segregation. Uh, because unless we understand this history, understanding it is not going to correct it on its own, obviously. Uh, it, uh, every civil rights victory that we've won in the past um, relied upon a combination of activism and mobilization, um, sometimes civil disobedience, sometimes marches, uh, as well as understanding. But understanding our constitutional obligation to remedy this is the first step. And so I'm um, very grateful to you for inviting me here to share this history with you. And um, I'm glad to engage in a conversation with you and with the rest of you uh, about it. Thank you. Thank you. And I remember uh, an, an uncle of mine who bought his farm outside Lima, Ohio with a farmer's home mortgage after World War II, 35 year fixed rate 1% loan and other relatives who got Veterans Administration mortgages. And I, I, I think that you, know, you described that post-World War II dynamic of sort of how a lot of uh, white families got on the wealth building express train, sort of launching people into multi-generational wealth, whereas people of color were kind of barred from that train. Um, but I think actually, I think some of the stories even a little bit worse, which is for, say, black families that wanted to buy a home that were excluded by FHA, they were sort of pushed into an older generation of kind of predatory loans or contract for deeds or things that thwarted the building of wealth. And I wonder if there's uh, a piece of that story or a piece of the, the, you know, the sort of the parallel narrative of, you know, as whites were getting access to home ownership, what was happening to uh, black families in that period. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. As I said, there are many, many policies the government followed, all of which reinforced each other and interlocked to create the system. And one of them, um, can I borrow a copy of the book for a second? Um, Here, I have a couple. Yeah. Thanks. I have it. One of them is a, a policy, and this is what you're referring to, which is called redlining. Um, this, uh, the cover of my book is a, uh, a map of Newark, New Jersey. And the areas that are covered red are the areas where um, the FHA or the VA would not insure mortgages for African Americans because they were African American neighborhoods. What I was talking about in, in the, my initial talk was uh, how it wouldn't uh, permit African Americans to move into uh, suburban white neighborhoods. These are urban neighborhoods that are primarily African American, but the FHA and VA wouldn't insure mortgages for them. Uh, people typically uh, think of this as private activity because it was banks that were discriminating. But these maps, there was a map like this of every metropolitan area in the country. They were drawn by the federal government, not by banks. These maps were drawn by a New Deal agency called the Homeowners Loan Corporation. And uh, areas were colored red if African Americans lived in them or near them. Uh, to guide the FHA and the VA into where they should not uh, insure mortgages and they were used by banks uh, because obviously if they couldn't get FHA or VA insurance they were much less le likely to uh, be willing to make loans and the result is that uh, African Americans as you said uh, had to buy homes on the installment plan on contract uh, and uh, gain no equity um, and if they missed a the payment they lost everything that they put into it just like you were going to buy a dress on the installment contract from the store. Mm -hmm. And uh, in order to make those payments, uh, they uh, had to subdivide their homes to increase their income. Uh, they had to double up and, uh, with, with other families. And uh, slums were created as a result from overcrowding. Uh, this was all a direct result of, of government policy. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder, um, you, know, you make a powerful point about how these patterns of residential segregation are, are harder to address. They're sort of intractable. And I was thinking, you know, many of us here uh, fit the description of uh, helping. We've either been helped by our parents' generation. We got the parental down payment assistance program because our parents, or we're helping the next generation. And I think that's one of the ways in which sort of these patterns can replicate themselves inadvertently. I mean, I think it's sort of like we're, we're 
people are just helping the next generation, helping their children. And it kind of reminded me of a, of a colleague of ours, Richard Reeves, who wrote this book, Dream Hoarders, talking about how advantage at the top is sort of reinforcing or compounding and reinforcing these patterns of segregation. And I, I wonder, are, you know, as, as people who are trying to grapple with this, are there examples of inadvertent things that are kind of replicating these patterns? Are there remedies that we can make where we have some agency, where we can make decisions about how to move forward differently? Yeah, uh, there certainly are. Um, you know, frequently people say to me that when they read uh, this history, it makes them angry. And I respond to them, it actually makes me hopeful. <laughs> because so long as we think it happened by accident, it can only unhappen by accident. If we understand that this racial segregation that we see everywhere around us is not some natural phenomenon, but something that was explicitly created by government racial policy, we can understand that there are policies to reverse it, to undo it. And uh, there are many, many policies, some that are quite easy to implement, that we could employ to desegregate this country. We're not going to do any of them. They're all politically unrealistic. They're not practically unrealistic. They're politically unrealistic because we do not have this understanding. We have a national myth of de facto segregation. We don't have a civil rights movement yet, although it's building. I'm very encouraged by that, that can um, base its activity on this, this history and, and, and reverse it. So I'll give you, should I give a couple of examples? Yeah, I think that'd be All great. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one is that uh, once the suburbs were created uh, to, uh, for whites only, and uh, as the values appreciated in these suburbs, the suburbs adopted zoning ordinances to ensure that nobody could follow the people who moved in there uh, who uh, wasn't wealthy. Uh, they, they're, the zoning ordinances, and there's a chapter in my book which I describe how they were racially motivated initially, but they didn't use race in their words. So suburbs, I don't know if Wellesley is like them, like this, but uh, uh, many suburbs in this country uh, are zoned, um, or most parts of the suburb are zoned, to exclude townhouses or single family homes on small lot sizes or uh, even uh, uh, small apartments. Uh, uh, to ensure that uh, no African Americans can live throughout the suburb, and if any area is zoned for multifamily use, it's uh, in a separate area of the suburb where uh, uh, nobody uh, can see them very well. So those zoning ordinances are unconstitutional, in my view. They're designed to lock in a segregation that was created explicitly uh, on the basis of race, and they should be abolished. Uh, we, every suburb should be required, every community, not just suburb, every community should be required to have a, a zoning that permits uh, the mic, a mix of uh, low income, moderate income, and middle class housing spread throughout its community. That's one easy reform we could do. Uh, at the low end, uh, you know, the federal government now has three big housing programs, uh, all of which uh, perpetuate segregation. Uh, the biggest one, is a subsidy to uh, middle class homeowners, mostly white. It's called the mortgage interest deduction. And it makes it um, uh, less expensive for single family homeowners. And the wealthier you are, the more, the, the more expensive your home is, the greater the value of the mortgage interest deduction. Um, and uh, the, the state income tax, uh, the, the state property tax rather uh, deduction. Um, that's a subsidy that maintains um, uh, the exclusivity of, of white communities. Uh, at the low end, we have uh, the Section 8 voucher program, which is a subsidy to low-income families that permits them to rent apartments at the median rent in their uh, local housing area um, uh, without paying more than 30 percent of their income. And the low-income housing tax credit, which is a subsidy, uh, a tax credit given out by the Treasury Department. Uh, for uh, the construction of homes for low-income families, and both of those reinforce segregation. Uh, a Section 8 voucher family uh, is more likely to live in a segregated neighborhood than a family with, with equally low income who doesn't have a Section 8 voucher, and the reason is that uh, the vouchers uh, can't be used in practical terms in middle-class neighborhoods. Uh, landlords are permitted in most parts of the country uh, 
I think probably not in Massachusetts, but in most parts of the country, they're permitted to refuse to rent to discriminate against Section 8 voucher holders, even though the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination on every other basis. The one form of discrimination that's permitted is you don't have to say I'm not renting you to you because you're black. I can, you can say I'm not renting to you because you have a subsidy to pay your rent, and that's legal. That can be eliminated. Uh, the, the, um, the, the subsidy itself, uh, which is based on the median rent in a broad area, uh, is if you think about it for a minute, you realize the median rent is going to be too low to rent in a middle class community uh, where rents are higher and too high to rent in an already segregated community where rents are lower and landlords um, uh, in, in low income segregated communities exploit the program by charging more than the market would otherwise require. Um, that could easily be reformed. We could easily adjust and, and there is uh, some effort now to do that. To, Easily, we could adjust the, the formula for creating sec for Section 8 vouchers so that it incentivizes the, the use of those vouchers in high opportunity communities and not in low opportunity communities. And then the low income housing tax credit is probably the worst one of all. And there's a whole low income housing industry which uh, uh, concentrates on developing low income housing in already low income segregated communities. Landlords would obviously, who get this tax credit, would obviously prefer to build housing in already low-income segregated communities because the land is cheaper there. And besides, they don't have to hold 55 community meetings to explain why they're building low-income housing in your community. Um, and so they, there's less trouble to build. So, but that could very easily be changed. Uh, we could simply change the way in which the low-income housing tax credits are awarded. So that they're awarded only to developers who build in high opportunity communities. So there are many, and there are many others we can follow as well. Um, oh, I mentioned the, the mortgage interest deduction and I book uh, one of the proposals I, I report on, it's not one I thought up myself, but uh, is to simply withhold the mortgage interest deduction from homeowners and suburbs that refuse to desegregate. Mm -hmm. That refuse to change their zoning ordinances to uh, permit uh, desegregation. Maybe uh, something less extreme is take those uh, mortgage interest deductions and put them in escrow and return them to the homeowners once their suburb does desegregate so that there's no permanent penalty involved. So many, many policies we can follow. Finally, and let me say that here's a radical one, okay? You want a radical one? I, I, the things I've described so far are easy. Um, take the example I gave before about the uh, 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 and these are all no costs. Everything I've mentioned so far wouldn't cost the government a cent to remedy this. Um, uh, in fact, if you withhold mortgage interest deduction, you know, the government could make money on desegregating. Um, but here's one that would cost some money, and I, I described the suburbanization movement. Uh, those homes in the mid-20th century cost $100,000, and they now sell for $500,000. The federal government could start, buy, start buying up some homes at market rates in these suburbs for $500,000, and resell them to qualified African Americans for $100,000. That would be a narrowly targeted constitutional remedy for a specific constitutional violation. And it would be completely justifiable constitutionally because it would be based on a history of discrimination. Um, uh, and it, it could be done. We're not about to do that unless we mobilize a new civil rights movement and an understanding of this history. Excellent. May I offer one other question and then we'll open up. Um, <clears throat> I mean, one of the things you point out in the, in the color of law is just as sort of illegal segregation policies you know, became illegal sort of in the mid 70s, was also the beginning of this period of sort of stagnation of wages, of this kind of period of inequality that we're living through. So really starting in the mid 70s, you have real wages for half the population pretty much staying flat or falling, and that's affecting blacks and Latinos, and, but it's also affecting a huge segments of working class whites. It's created this interesting political moment. So we're, as we try to face the legacy of residential segregation and the racial wealth divide, we also have this stagnant wage dilemma where a white working class is not feeling like it's sharing in the growth of the economy. So it's a particularly challenging time to talk about the racial legacy when uh, you know, I, so I'm just interested in your sort of, how do you think about these two trends? You have a century-long legacy of racism and wealth building, 
alongside a more recent couple decades of growing inequality, growing concentration of wealth, and how that is politically shaping this conversation, this, this, this history that we're trying to grapple with? Well, I would, I would have to suggest that racial segregation is the only problem this country faces. Uh, there are others that you just mentioned, and, and we have uh, an economic system which needs reform, cries out for reform, we have growing inequality. Uh, but I will say this, that uh, one of the reasons that we have political polarization in this country that prevents us from enacting those kinds of reforms is because we have created a caste system which uh, separates whites from blacks, uh, prevents coalitions from developing, uh, sets whites and blacks against each other. That's a product of the policies that I've uh, uh, described. So uh, certainly segregation isn't the only problem we face, but it exacerbates not only itself, but the other problems we face as well. Great question. Um, one uh, World of Wellesley feature sometimes of these programs is we just want to take a moment for you to just talk to a neighbor uh, just about what is it you're feeling, what is it you're thinking, what reflections do you have. So this is an opportunity to turn to someone, ideally not someone you came with, someone that you might and introduce yourself and just share. We're just talking about for oh, between five minutes total, you know, any thoughts, reflections as you've heard uh, Richard's talk. Um, so let's do that. Just I'll give you a five, a, a, a one minute warning. So hopefully that primed you or got you your minds thinking of a question that you might have for Richard. So let's uh, let's hear from you. Any any questions? One right here. Yeah. Well, I noticed that on page two hundred and five there was a discussion of Massachusetts and that Massachusetts is doing some good things with respect to low income housing. It's not specifically addressing race, but. I just moved here two months ago from Montgomery County, Maryland, and that's mentioned on the next page. <laughs> and my development, the problem is Wellesley is, is rather built up, but I lived in Montgomery County and there were new developments being built all the time. And the development I lived in was, uh, I guess, 250 homes when, the, when we moved there, but then it was being expanded. And because this law had been passed for the county, that any new development, more than 50 units, I think, had to include a certain percentage of moderately priced dwelling units. That's what happened. Our, na our neighborhood got that number of units built. People back there here? Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, well, well um, this woman has recently moved from Montgomery County, Maryland. Welcome. And uh, in the book, you know, uh, Richard talks about Massachusetts and Maryland doing inclusionary zoning policies that are positive. So, I'll say any more about that? Yeah. Well, Chuck's right. The book Richard talks about inclusionary zoning positive. Yeah, there's some, there's some uh, uh, interesting of Mass uh, New Jersey has what's called a fair share program, which requires every community to uh, move towards having housing for a fair share of its low-income population. Uh, it can't be based on race, and none of these programs can be based on race, because at this point, the Supreme Court, in its wisdom, denies that the federal government has anything to do, or state governments has anything to do with creating segregation, so you can't have a remedy for racial discrimination. So the way some communities get around it is by um, uh, uh, policies that help low-income families uh, move into high opportunity communities. It's an important, um, uh, important policy. There, there are two things I would say about it. One is it's great, but it does nothing to undo the existing segregation that only applies to new housing, and not every community has as much open space as Montgomery County, so there's not as much opportunity to do it. And the second thing is that we've segregated the uh, working class and middle-income African Americans as well, not as much as low-income African Americans, but we have middle-class African-American suburbs because African-Americans are not able to buy into uh, white communities, and that needs to be addressed as well. So, but yeah, you're right. Those are good programs, and uh, they're a step in the right direction. Or more like Aladdin was like the corporate 
verified that done uh, laws recently that they've addressed. But if we can't work with the government, you know, what can we do um, as individuals or through a foundation? Well, I gave one example of what everybody can do, and that is uh, see how this is taught in the schools. And I guarantee you, if you make an issue of the curriculum in the schools around this uh, topic, you'll start a conversation out among the adults as well. Yeah, I was thinking more along the lines of, like, I, I feel like it's like a group of developers got together, and they said, you know, we're going to take a look at the city, and we're going to build, like, six houses in various locations, you know, whatever. And I don't think that you could possibly favor um, African Americans from buying that home. Correct? Well, um, that's correct, yeah. yeah. But um, so long as the zoning regulations exist, uh, you cannot build housing that's affordable uh, for um, African Americans or anybody uh, in exclusive suburbs, uh, or except in, in isolated, segregated sections of those suburbs, which is sometimes not. So uh, I don't see how you do it. Um, Unless the, the foundation was subsidized, like a group of wealthy people. You know what I'm saying? Like, we get together. But they'd be prohibited by the zoning yeah. rules of the, of the community yeah. from building housing on small lot sizes or building townhouses. So those, those zoning ordinances need to be changed, and, and that has to be done through political action. Mm -hmm. Hi, I just want to offer a little perspective on the Massachusetts Zoning Law that you is a good start. Um, I happen to work in affordable housing, and that law has been in place for 50 years now, just about, and it's built about 60,000 units of housing, about 30,000 of them affordable, but most of them, I, I mean, if you look at the segregation patterns in Greater Boston, in Massachusetts, you don't see anything different than, um, than what's been described here. And there is a lot of communities in order to accept a project like that, they require a local preference when you're leasing off that property or selling those units. Mm -hmm. And the fair housing laws do require an analysis of the maximum local preference is 70% of the units. But what that does is it, it keeps the community, I mean, you're meeting the needs of the community, which is good, but it doesn't bring different people into the community. There's some limits. There is, um, has been probably for 15 years or more, proposed legislation to require every community in Massachusetts to have multifamily zoning and that has never been politically viable. And there is a little bit of a change in that armor right now in a proposal that the governor recently put forth that is actually supported by the Mass Municipal Association, which is really important, which makes it easier for communities to change their own zoning. Because mm -hmm. right now you need a super majority and it will only require a majority. There's some other things the governor's doing, but uh, something you can do is right here in your community, there are a number of community developments proposed under that affordable housing law. And you can show up to support it, but you can also maybe try not to have a local preference be um, included in those properties so that maybe you do get a little more diversity. Mm -hmm. There are little drops in the bucket, but it's something you can do in the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, here and then. Well, I wonder if there's an opportunity for reparation with by um, cities or towns partnering with banks to subsidize mortgages for African Americans to go wherever they want to go, but to get them more at the lower rate and subsidize them in some capacity. Because I do think, to your point, it's been unconstitutional. This was put into place. There's reparations in other areas. I mean, the United States has never done that for the African American community. And that's an opportunity. And has that been considered? Or is anybody interested in that? Or? Well, um, you know, I mentioned before, is one of the possible remedies is a subsidy <laughs> to uh, uh, African Americans to purchase homes. Uh, that are otherwise unaffordable to them in communities with, from which they were excluded when they were affordable. Uh, uh, it would be terrific if, if banks and uh, private institutions came up with money to do that, but uh, that's a lot of money. And uh, I don't know that uh, it could reach the scale that's necessary uh, to make a certain <coughs> dent in the segregation of any community without government funds. But, to demonstrate what should be done, that would be a great idea. 
But it's not that much money if there are only 10% of the population in the U.S. <coughs> is black. So if people always estimate it's costing too much, when in reality, the, po the black population in this country is small. But I don't think we, you know, we put... Well, I'm not suggesting that we can't afford it. What I'm saying is there's no political support for spending money to desegregate this country. And uh, I'm counting on you to build that support. That's why I'm killing myself going around the country. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh. I was wondering, um, there's a lot of development going on. Supposedly, they make these deals with developers that a uh, percentage is going to be whatever, but there's no teeth to it. So at the end, when they sell it off or whatever, you're right back where you started. How can, what would be a way to actually put teeth to it, to hold people to the original agreement or what? I don't understand. Well, I don't have a gimmick for you. So. <laughs> it requires political will. It requires enforcement of these agreements. And uh, I'm not an expert in Massachusetts law, and I have a lot of states to cover. I don't, I don't know much about Massachusetts, but uh, if these agreements aren't being uh, followed, um, you know, there needs to be enforcement, and the only way to do that is by getting an effective political majority to enforce it. I, I'm giving you cliches, but I don't know any, any more details about you know Massachusetts than that. I have a little thought on that. Oh, okay, good. I was just going to say, one of the interesting things in Boston is there's a now focus on how do you create permanently affordable housing? And that's sort of the measure of success. So included in that would be public housing, but also nonprofit owned rental housing, uh, home ownership where there's a sort of resale restriction so that appreciation in land value doesn't push the house. So if we as a community, if Wellesley or any community puts in huge subsidies to create initial affordability, grant money, charitable money, we wave our magic wand and we make that land more dense and allow more density. Anytime we create and invest public resources, we demand that that housing be part of the permanent affordable home ownership or rental market. And so that, Boston's now at about 19, 20 percent. And that's good because that means that those residents are not competing in the speculative market for their housing and we're making better use of our subsidies. So that, that's an example where, you know, unfortunately, the developers would say, I'm going to develop 10 units of affordable home ownership and they're affordable for the first five minutes until they're sold back on the market and lost. So that's, that's what a lot of communities now are getting more sophisticated in saying, if we're going to make that kind of investment, let's lock it up. The other thing, just to the question of money, I'm thinking sort of about what San Francisco did recently. They just put in place a, a very high-end real estate transfer tax on the transfer of properties over $5 million. So it's very targeted to this huge wealth effect that's distorting our cities right now. And, and, uh, and then they dedicated that revenue. Now, they've chosen to put that revenue into higher education. There's no reason why you couldn't say a very high-end real estate transfer tax could be dedicated to a fund that provides that access to a permanently affordable housing. Like the 40-year, 1% fixed rate mortgage, you offer enough of those, people are, you know, that was what people were excluded from. Why couldn't we say, well, you know, we, we excluded people, we didn't offer that 50 years ago, now that's going to be one of the vehicles that will get people into the market, so. Um, yeah, back over here. Right. Speak up there. I have a two part question. One is um, I'm curious. Um, I know in Harlem um, in the 80s or 90s there was a situation where um, apartment buildings, um, the local people who lived in the apartment, the government was able to allow them to purchase their apartment. And, and, and now Harlem is like a, a mech, like many people are moving there. And so the community is turned over, but people own their apartments. And I'm curious. <laughs> Um, if that's a common pro um, program where instead of having people move to other communities, there was a system where within their community they're able to stay and, and, and own their places. So that's one question, part of that question. And in and, 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 uh, Newark, 
I noticed that um, they're building what they call teacher villages and other specialized <coughs> spaces to, um, to redevelop their downtown, but they, they designated those spaces as for specific um, groups and populations, whatever. And I'm wondering, is that a new form of trying to create that more integrated community? So that's my wondering. Part. And my second question is, is the idea of um, if the federal government was intentionally creating these spaces that desegregated, when, and you maybe said this and I was not here, when did, when did the government decide, oh, we need to create this policy now to say that we are, housing has to be open and free? When did that transition? Because on every mortgage document and every rental lease, there's that, that statement that says we cannot discriminate based on color. Was it a lawsuit? Was it a movement? When did this switch over? In 1968, almost exactly 50 years ago, uh, the Fair Housing Act was passed, which is where the language that you're talking about comes from. It wasn't, uh, there were no enforcement mechanisms added until 1988. So uh, we really didn't have a Fair Housing Act until 1988. But um, the Fair Housing Act only prohibits future discrimination. It doesn't do anything to undo the rigid patterns that were created by the previous policies I described. And that's why we need aggressive remedies that are uh, equal to the power of the policies that were followed to segregate. But let me say this. And I, I, um, I don't want to take too long on this answer, but you know, in, in 1866, the 13th Amendment was adopted. Uh, 1865, the 13th Amendment was adopted, abolishing slavery. And nobody, I don't think, who supported the 13th Amendment anticipated that the purpose of this amendment was simply to turn slaves into serfs. Uh, and Congress in 1866, under the 13th Amendment, passed a law prohibiting discrimination in housing because it understood the 13th Amendment has a Section 2 in it, which requires Congress to pass legislation to implement the 13th Amendment. And Congress in 1866 understood that you couldn't um, truly emancipate the slaves without making them equal citizens with the right to buy and sell property and rent property. The Supreme Court prohibited Congress from enforcing that law. So actually, it was not 1968 when housing segregation was prohibited. It was 1866. And it wasn't until 1968 that, uh, in another case, that the Supreme Court recognized, oh, we were wrong back then. 102 years had passed, and uh, nothing was done to rectify uh, the uh, policies that government followed in those 102 years when it was actually unlawful, a violation of the 13th as well as the 14th and 5th Amendments. And uh, we passed a law in 1968 for the bar discrimination going forward without any enforcement mechanisms and added enforcement mechanisms only in 1988. I just, uh, I was just going to speak to the first part of your question. A lot of jurisdictions have created kind of resident first option to buy laws, particularly in apartment buildings. New York City has homesteading. Washington, D.C., if your apartment building comes up for sale, uh, you you and the other residents can get together and have a first right of refusal to buy the building. So there's, it's a recognition in public policy that creating more ownership, low, you know, resident ownership is a good thing. And the city has a whole support structure to support those uh, resident Buyouts. Here in Massachusetts, mobile home parks have a resident first option to buy uh, provision. So it's a, it's a property right that expands the possibilities, and then the question is, do you create a support structure? But we, we, I think that's, we should be doing more of that kind of thing to, to enable people who are tenants to purchase the properties they're in when they, when they come up for sale. I think it would have a positive effect. I saw some. Yes, sir. There. Yeah. Um, you made a reference to Ferguson, Missouri. I was wondering if you could talk about not only zoning laws, but just the division of 
into smaller and smaller municipal jurisdictions was how that was used as a way of creating segregation and perpetuating that. Well, um, I don't know about the small jurisdictions part of it, but you know, when Ferguson came into the news because of the killing of Michael Brown by a police officer and the riots that followed afterwards, you know, people asked, how did the suburb become majority African American? We thought African Americans lived in cities. Uh, how come this is a, a suburb? And that happened because of the, the, some of the same kinds of policies that the uh, uh, the gentleman over there was describing, uh, you know, we call it today gentrification. Um, uh, back then, it was the same policy. We called it urban renewal. And in the uh, early, uh, in the 1970s and 80s and even 60s, uh, the city of St. Louis uh, demolished housing in the African American neighborhood of, of St. Louis. Uh, they built, uh, you know, half of McDonald's sign to signal the entrance <laughs> to the west, <laughs> uh, down the Mississippi <laughs> River. And yeah, and they. Uh, you know, they built uh, hospitals and universities all on the land that was had been occupied by African Americans, and these people were displaced. Where were they going to go? Turns out, of course, they couldn't go any place in the metropolitan area because they were excluded from them, except for one or two communities that uh, had apartment rentals that were available to families who had Section 8 vouchers or were otherwise low income. So the African American population concentrated in uh, service in a couple of other neighboring communities. The same thing is happening today with gentrification, the kinds of policies that we described before where a share of housing, even in gentrifying communities, is reserved for low and moderate income families, even if we succeed in doing that. And it's very difficult to do that. But even if we succeed in doing that, that doesn't, that doesn't speak to the majority of families who would be displaced, even if you could just preserve a share of housing for the previous residents. And right now, all across the country, what gentrification is doing, uh, even in places where there are attempts to preserve housing for some of the previous residents, it's simply displacing uh, the existing uh, low-income community to another area, usually a, a more distant suburb, which is even, where it's even more difficult to get the jobs um, than, than it was previously, because the entire metropolitan areas weren't um, uh, open. So after the Ferguson riots, for example, the city of St. Louis passed a law um, prohibiting what I was talking about before, prohibiting discrimination against Section 8 vouchers. That was the big integration reform, saying any landlord in St. Louis had to rent to a Section 8 voucher holder and could discriminate. But it didn't speak to the county of St. Louis, which is where most of the exclusion takes place. Uh, so, so long as we don't do something to desegregate the suburbs, uh, the desegregation policy simply within city limits is not going to accomplish much. Accomplish something, I mean, these are all little steps that will accomplish something, but not much. Um, you mentioned in your book something about President Obama passing an act to, I think, enforce the 1988 Enforcement Act. Is that right? And then that was recently revoked. Could you explain a little bit more about what that is all about? Well, um, it's, uh, it's not exactly what I think, uh, but um, you, know, you remember something. <laughs> I think what I was talking about was that um, at the end of the Obama administration, they adopted the rule, the administration adopted the rule, first the Section 8 voucher problem I was talking about, which allows uh, local housing authorities to increase the amount of voucher for rental in middle class communities and decrease it for rental in already segregated communities. The uh, uh, Trump administration refused to enforce that rule uh, unlawfully because you know, it was adopted through the regular rulemaking process. Um, the uh, civil rights groups went to court. A local district court ordered the Obama administration, uh, ordered the Trump administration to enforce this rule. And uh, the enforcement order takes effect on April 1st, so we'll see what happens. But it's only a few communities that applies to. It was not a nationwide program. You had mentioned that what stirred your interest in this area were some uh, a Supreme Court case involving education uh, where Justice Roberts decided 
that this was all de facto uh, integrate segregation. Uh, you make a fair case for it not being de facto uh, segregation. So it, it, one was, was any of the information that you have in your book included in the briefs that was submitted there? And two, are you aware of any court cases that might be in the pipeline now uh, in support of uh, desegregation plans uh, where your, your research might be used? Well, um, we actually did have one success. Um, uh, in 2015, the Supreme Court um, upheld, this is a, a bit technical, but uh, the Supreme Court upheld the use of the disparate impact standard under the Fair Housing Act, which means that the Supreme Court said that it, you can, uh, uh, the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development can find, for example, a low-income housing tax credit program in the state, the kind of thing I was talking about before, violates the Fair Housing Act if it disproportionately places uh, low-income housing tax credits in already segregated communities. Um, and the Supreme Court used this history uh, as one of the bases for saying that um, this was an appropriate remedy. So there was one success recently along this, but mostly this is not going to happen through court action because um, the way our legal system works, nobody would have standing to sue to challenge policies that uh, were implemented 50 or 60 years ago, even though their effects still persist today. So the way this is going to happen is by the adoption of policies. And then somebody will challenge them, they'll go to court, and the Supreme Court will have to rule on the validity of these policies. So it's not that lawyers won't be involved. It's this, uh, They'll, they'll still be full employment for civil rights lawyers. <laughs> it won't come about because some, I mean, uh, an African-American living in an urban area cannot go to court and say that if only my great-grandfather had been permitted to buy a home in the suburbs, I would now be a wealthy man. Mm. Uh, that, that's not the kind of case you can pursue under our legal system. Darn. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the 
system, the, the source of revenue. But there's an easy solution to that too. Um, uh, the Prop 13 should be amended so that it continues to freeze property taxes for existing homeowners. But at the point where they sell their homes, the lost property taxes can be recouped. So that, for example, if you have a home that uh, you bought for $100,000 and you're paying property taxes at the that assessed value, um, and you're frozen, and then 15 years later, you sell that home for $600,000, uh, having paid only 1% in property tax, increase in property taxes all those years when property taxes for everybody else is rising for 5 or 6%. So from that $500,000 profit, the taxes that you didn't have to pay are then recouped by uh, the state, and so the state doesn't lose revenue uh, permanently at the same time that the uh, homeowners are protected uh, from increases in property taxes while they own their homes. So instead of making a $500,000 profit on that home, you only make a $475,000 profit. It's a, like I said, the solutions to all of these are fairly obvious. Uh, what, um, what we need to do is develop the political will to um, uh, implement these, these uh, solutions, and that's only something that you can do. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Yeah. Like in Massachusetts, we have probably two and a half percent, so we have something similar. Um, but what would, what would those municipalities do in the schools without the revenue collected to support the schools? Well, what I'm saying is that they would recoup it at point of sale. But that could be 30 years. Well, not everybody. You know, there's, a, there's constantly, there are constantly sales being uh, being made. It would substantially reduce the losses that the communities are facing from, from this kind of freeze in property taxes. Uh, that every, you know, that it's not everybody selling a home at the same point 30 years from now. Every year, there are people always selling their homes. And the uh, money is being recouped and, and returned. Obviously, uh, the first year you implement this program, it's not going to undo all the damage it's done in the past. Uh, it will prohibit, uh, prevent ongoing damage for the future. We have time for one more question, comment, or last word, anyone? <laughs> well, I'll do it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Victor. Oh, okay. All right, sure Michelle. <laughs> oh, all right. Go ahead. Um, so I don't know. I don't think that I, I learned this in your book or, or heard about this in your book. But one of the reasons that um, is this what you found in your research is one of the reasons why governments and the leaders at the time decided that they wanted to uh, create this home ownership for white people. Uh, when homeowners, white people, I'm sorry, when white people were predominantly renting, was that they were um, thinking about communism. And they said that, well, if we put white people in homes, then that'll give them more of a security and a base to America owning a piece of land, and they're less likely to become communists. Well, Michelle, I hate to uh, challenge your memory. <laughs> but you did read that in my book. Oh, okay. <laughs> in 1918, some geniuses in the Woodrow Wilson administration decided that, that, that if they could move urban families into single families, uh, homes in the suburbs, that it was an exclusively white program, um, uh, those uh, workers wouldn't become Bolsheviks like the Russians had become. And uh, during the 1920s, uh, the uh, Harding administration and the Coolidge administration, uh, Herbert Hoover was the Secretary of Commerce in both of those administrations, had a program to propagandize the white population to move into single family homes. So they sent, a, and this was a very explicit racial program, they sent the African community organizers working with the Commerce Department, going to white communities, holding meetings, telling people that the way to avoid racial strife was to move out of the cities and into the suburbs. Um, after I wrote the book, I, uh, I discovered a poster that the Federal Housing Administration had produced during World War II, which shows a, a young black man being led away in handcuffs, and the, uh, the, the banner is, uh, at the top is Escape Crime, who 
the suburbs. Mm -hmm. This is a Federal Housing Administration propaganda. So yeah, this started in the 1930s, 1920s as a way to um, uh, prevent communism. And then it became a, 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 an explicitly racial program. And the, the, it was all propaganda until the Federal Housing Administration saw it put money into it. Mm. Can you give us the homework that you gave me? Can you tell everyone to um, look at their deed? Oh, well, you know, in, in the book I actually described you know, the, the um, uh, every home that was built prior to 1950 and many that were built after that probably has one of these clauses in its deeds that uh, prohibit resale to non-whites or rental to non-whites. And one of the things, this is not just for you individually, because it's very expensive. I mean, they still exist. You can't change a deed. You know, once a, the deed is passed on from owner to owner, uh, and it's very expensive for an individual to hire a lawyer to go and have the deed changed. But as a matter of public policy, clerks could be ordered to massively, to, to systematically remove these clauses from the deeds. And what I suggest instead uh, is instead of simply removing the clauses from the deeds, a clause should be added to the deed, saying that we recognize that this home um, used to have an offensive uh, and uh, uh, inappropriate and shameful language in it, and we want to assert in our deed that we are proud to live in a community that welcomes everybody. And, uh, that could be a policy initiative that could be taken by groups like yours. I know the town clerk that just got elected. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Casey. Um, so thank you so much. Can we have a huge round of applause for Richard Austin? Thank you so much. And we have also a special um, thank you to the Chuck Collins. work that we're very, very grateful for. And thank you to Wellesley Access Cable for uh, filming this event because I know it's town meeting tonight. So there are a lot of leaders uh, that are making policies and decisions that need to see this. So I will be sending it to them. Hello. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much for everyone for coming um, to this great event. Well, the Wellesley is so excited to be able to sponsor these events. Thank you to the Wellesley Community Center who allows us to use this space for free. You know that Wellesley, a very prime location uh, for space and to be able to have a beautiful space like this. We are very thankful for Steve and the Community Center here. So uh, please again, um, uh, Betsy Kamyadi actually called me today and uh, asked me to recommend, uh, she is my friend and also uh, president of the Friends of Wellesley Metco, which is a fundraising arm for Wellesley Metco, which I definitely look into if you don't know anything about that. Um, but she suggested that we buy up all of Richard's books, for sure, and Chuck's, and share them and maybe take your own book that you've read, either donate it to your library, if um, Wellesley Public Library, I don't know if Wellesley Public Library has a few copies, um, but also give it to a neighbor, um, and then maybe have them pay it forward, give it to someone else, and we continue to share the book, and then maybe we pass it around for a year, get 10 people reading it, and then we all gather together and, and have a conversation and try to figure out what policies we can affect. So thank you, Betsy, for this suggestion. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. And have a very safe evening. And thank you.